Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today I am joined by my good friend Zach from Two and a Mic. And today we are jumping into three body problem. And I kind of just want to go ahead and kick things off if that's all right with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Can't wait. I wanted to ask, what do you think makes this story so interesting, hard to adapt? You know, what makes it generally stand out for you? To be honest, this story is really interesting because I think if you were, you have actually mentioned it as well in our previous conversations that once we spoke about this before and you brought it up and you said, this is such a great story. And I said, you know, what? I tried that. And I couldn't complete it or something. And then I had to go back to it. And the second time around, I absolutely loved it. What makes it so interesting in, in many ways is, for a start, the cultural diversity, as in the book starts with a, a particularly significant chapter of Chinese history. Yeah. Uh, and straight away, it throws you into the, the political machinations of the time um, and the, the the complicated personalities and arguments. And when you go into the book, you think, okay, this is a sci-fi fantasy book. Why are we talking about this? Um, and it was a bit, it kind of threw me off. But then you get to reflect on it the more you go through the book. And I just found that particular perspective to be an intriguing way of beginning what turns out to be this epic saga. Yeah, epic saga is really, I mean, that's the word I feel like, because starting off with uh, Yeah, Wencia and the Cultural Revolution, it is a bit jarring at first because you go into it and you're like, okay, this, this doesn't quite feel like sci-fi just yet, where, I mean, it is a little bit of an alternate history, but I mean, these things did happen. So it's not like alternate, alternate. It's just, you know, aliens. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it it covers a big portion of this book is a period drama. So it does make things different. Yeah. And it's always great to get. I mean, you know that I love listening to different perspectives. And it, it just seems to me that all the way through this book, I'm constantly pelted with different perspectives. These are not the standard views that you would listen to from a Hollywood production or a European production. You know, these are alternative considerations. These are viewpoints which are non-standard um, and which really make you kind of reflect upon you know, the, the sort of opinions that we've always been privy to when we watch whatever kinds of media it is that we engage in. And, and I found that to be, it gave it a bit more depth because Almost after yeah, every chapter, I had to question, okay, what did you experience there? And, and that comes up quite a bit. Yeah, I think one of the things about the series as a whole that feels so different for me is I know that I've talked quite a bit about, you know, character driven plots versus plot driven. And with Three Body Problem, this the book series specifically, our characters aren't like the stereotypical like feeling type. They're much more logical. They're much more perceptive and kind of like sensing. They're kind of feeling what's out there, but they're not sitting with themselves and really having these long narrations where you kind of know exactly what's going on in their head all the time. And for someone like me, it's really refreshing, but it's also jarring because it feels so different to a lot of the science fiction and fantasy that I read. But I do really appreciate those different perspectives that are kind of outside, I want to say, with like a lot of American, you know, character driven, just characters in general, I guess. Yeah, I mean, when, when you mention that, I, I try to think back to myself to what, what is the most emotional part um, of the first book, shall we say? And the most emotional part, if I remember the, if I'm remembering the great book correctly, is in the imagination of one of the protagonists, where he kind of brings to life this a romantic side that of what he considers to be his true love. But it's purely in his imagination. Um, Are we talking about? Uh, yeah, you're going to have to say the names here because Yun I'm. Yun Ming. I, I believe so. Yeah, that's okay. the one. That's, yeah, okay. that sounds. And whereas, as you say, with the other characters, now I, I again, I I've met a few Chinese people, um, uh, but not enough 
for me, yeah, I'd, I'd need to meet at least, I don't know, 780 million of them to be able to give, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know right. a kind of general opinion, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but so when I think about this and what you just said, you know, is it that Chinese people are being represented here as being very logical? Or is this the the personality trait of Xi Jinping and how he sees the world? And therefore, he is quite logical and not necessarily emotional. Yeah. And is that why these characters are like, I don't he know. writing what he knows, you know, personally? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's but a really good question. I mean, it's interesting because, as you say, I mean, Another thing was when I compare sort of European television with US produced television, so like TV shows and so on, I find American TV shows to be a little bit more action based. Um, they're fast moving. They're, there's a lot of explosions, you know, people yeah. walking away from a bomb going off in the background. Put that on kind sunglasses, of take them off <laughs> dramatically. <laughs> That's it, exactly. Yeah. Wavy hair and all that. Um, whereas the European dramas, they tend to develop characters a bit more. And this is why I really loved Bosch. I don't know if you've seen Bosch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but it really goes into character development, you know, his passion for his music, his friends, you know, his belief structure and all of that. Um, and I found this goes into a lot of belief structure, but as you say, not so much passion, logic but not emotion. So yeah, there's a, a lot of different perspective in that. Yeah, even yeah, when Sia is, she's so closed off. And I mean, there were segments of this book where I felt I was having a more visceral, visceral reaction to things that she was going through than she did. Putting aside like her killing her husband and her boss, you know, like that's like the big one. But there's that, whole segment where she's in the village and kind of like raising her daughter amongst these people in this village and it was so tragic but beautiful where like she had things were going in a way for her that probably in her whole life had never happened where she felt at peace but at the same time she was still so closed off and it was just it was gut-wrenching for me to read this because it was like oh you know like this little segment of humanity for her, this little, you know, slice of peace in her life, if it would have happened earlier, would she have pushed the button or would it have not mattered? Because like she is very guarded with her feelings. You can't quite know for sure. Yeah, there's a definite impenetrability to the way that they are presented within the story. And yeah, I mean, as you said, the cold hearted nature of the actions, I mean, she didn't want to kill her husband but right. i mean wrong place wrong time you know? <laughs> yeah, she, yeah. Did, did you have to be so insistent young man you know oh well right. i hear the consequences and uh yeah so <laughs> that's a hard scene wasn't it? it it was really rough but i mean it's just it on one hand i understand why she did what she did but it's still you know villainous but i still find her sympathetic so i do think like when people kind of say oh you know i don't like the characterizations they're just not dimensional enough for me i'm like i i just i don't see it like or maybe i see it differently because the way that she's written as a whole i just feel so fascinating i feel a lot about this character even though she's not telling me you know how i should feel or what she's feeling it's just interesting that an author can still give you a reaction like that but without relying on the character being like a deep feeler i guess so i i think it's great yeah i mean she seems to be somebody who makes decisions very quickly within a certain process. Um, it, it kind of reminds me a bit about poker. You're sort of pot committed. Once you've made a certain decision, then you have to stick with your hand, whatever happens. And it okay. seems as though she very quickly sticks to her hand and therefore, yeah, whatever happens, that's the hand I'm going to play. Um, and she does definitely do that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do we want to talk a little bit about the science or, you know, the politics or? Uh, yeah, I mean. Or is there could... something else you want to touch on? Well, I mean, we could talk about the, the 
I suppose both the science and the politics. And the science is well above my pay grade. I think Still it's same. fair to say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <Same. laughs> I, I loved reading it. And to be honest, I, I work with a, a few engineers, and what I've actually said to them: please watch this as soon as you can, because I can't wait to get your impressions on the science um, and whether or not you can explain this in a way that will make sense to me. There is a part. I can't, okay, we're jumping ahead here, but there is Go one part it. in in book three where essentially the scientists in the future are trying to come up with some kind of an analogy for a certain scientific process. And then this 20th century politician, again, I can't remember, sorry, scientist, this 20th century scientist comes up with this fantastic explanation, which is so simple. They say, well, you have just managed to achieve uh, what has taken me over 200 years to explain. Um, so I find Xi Jin Liu's book to be this maybe all of it is this his dedication to the three-body problem yeah. and does this answer or address the question completely i don't know it's i'm not intelligent enough uh, to be able to answer that to me it feels like he had a deep fascination with this question with this problem right and to the point where like you can't solve it like that's clear the only option is try Solarin's leave and find somewhere else but despite having such a large chunk of the book dedicated to the three body problem I love how it's just like abandoned it's like yeah that's that's we're gonna spend all this time with it but there's nothing that we can do here we can't solve it so it's a really excellent way of like a plot device like moving the for the story forward while I mean for me this is something that I never considered I never was kept up at night wondering you know oh what would happen on a planet where there were three sons like that was nothing in my wheelhouse nothing that I was seeking out to learn something about so it's interesting it's interesting but I mean that's just one of many many scientific concepts that he throws at you where it's just like you know you're like dodging and ducking and he's just winging them at you left and right and I do appreciate the fact that it's not dumbed down. It's not spoon feeding you anything. No, absolutely. I mean, all of the interactions which relate to the the different dimensions and when people move from the three dimension to the so the, there was a, was it a, a two dimension or four dimensional window in space and then how they move and also this great part when they first go into two dimensional space and they're told okay don't move your hands too quickly because you could puncture your internal organs yes <laughs> <Thank you>. <laughs> <laughs> I love how like subtly like that's that verges on so much horror I think where it's like when I'm thinking about the adaptation I can absolutely 100% understand why the showrunners chose this series like there is so many kind of bizarre shocking things but it's not you know like it's not horror in like a traditional jump scare type of way there's a lot of like body horror brains being you know like launched into space people <laughs> worrying about not you know puncturing themselves internally because they're in a different dimension and it's just like i mean this guy's mind is fascinating <laughs> like it, who comes up with this <laughs> absolutely it's it is crazy and i mean also the trisolarians you know um how are they going to be presented <laughs> this you know these they sort of regularly turn into some kind of dust and then they're you know <laughs> reanimated and yet they still have a conscience and yeah. uh, i mean that's just going to be yeah, I mean, th there is a challenge. I mean, if people wonder why this particular group of individuals were chosen to produce the story, it's probably because they are considered to have the the creative ability to actually embody this kind of visualization that the author had. I think your average storyteller producer probably wouldn't be able to manage it. I mean, a lot of people say that this is unadaptable. And I think the first book, not too hard. I mean, video games these days, you can have, you know, a close enough situation where when they go into the VR game that it doesn't have to be so expensive budget wise. But once you get a little bit further into the story, 
I mean, I don't know how you could do the fourth dimension. Like, I don't, I don't know how someone could map that out in a way where it feels realistic, but also easy enough to understand what you're seeing, because you can't just, you know, like make everything see through, <laughs> like you, you have to present something that people are able to watch where it's like, I don't know how they're going to do it, but it's definitely, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be very difficult. And also like the the shocking moment. I mean, for me, these plot twists were always so interesting because saying that I'm not, you know, I'm not a very scientific person, but where you're dealt with these concepts and they sit with you for a while, sometimes they're abandoned for half of a book and then they come back. And typically what I found for myself is when the storyline looped back around and you revisit this concept and it's a part of a big plot twist, somehow when it like clicks into place in your mind, and if you can, if you can see it coming, you know, right before it happens, you have that like eureka moment where it's like, oh, I see what he did. That was great. That was great. And it's hard to find series like that. I mean, I'm not trying to say this to be to talk down on other series, but to an extent, I feel like people who read often, you start to kind of fall into like a pattern recognition where it's like, oh, I know what's going to happen. Like, I know this trope. I know how this is going to end. And I think what the author did was pretty masterful in terms of making things unique, making things shocking, but not too difficult that you're not going to understand when that happens. If that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> no, I, I see. I, I mean, as you were speaking, the thought came to me that science fiction as a genre can uh, contain such varied differences as Star Wars and at the same time, Interstellar. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think Three Body Problem definitely falls into the interstellar category. There is a mm -hmm. lot of science. There's a lot of science which will probably necessitate people to watch the series more than once. Yeah. Um, I know I didn't get everything about Interstellar the first time around, maybe even the second time around, but I, 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 I wanted to revisit it. I wanted to learn more and understand the science behind it. And I have a feeling the same thing will also happen with the, the series. I mean, when I finished reading Death's End or listening to Death's End, I, I wanted to jump back into Three Body Problem from the beginning again, you know? Yeah. Um, it does grab you the science. There is an interest generated from the way it is presented. And that is great. Yeah, it really is. It reminds me a little bit of like the feeling that I had when I watched Arrival, where like she's learning the language. And then all of a sudden, when it's like revealed that the language is kind of like the circular way of like... <sighs> It's hard to explain, but just how she's able to see past and present and future all at once in a loop. It was kind of that same feeling for me with three body problem where like when these big concepts finally make sense to you, it's like really gratifying, like deeply gratifying. Yeah, and um, and the way it's explained as well through the, through the game, as you say, so you know mm -hmm. how they're going to present that within the game. I, I think you're right, as in nowadays, Gaming technology is so good. It's almost like watching a movie when you play. I mean, if we're talking like Call of Duty or uh, Last of Us or whatever uh, game, it, game it is that you're playing, yeah, they are really detailed. And, and being able to present these kinds of, of storylines, I, I think you know, it's a challenge, but I think they'll manage it. From the trailer, we kind of get a bit of a glimpse as to how they're going to present the, the big eye, the, the two-dimensional world. So fun. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that looks fascinating, doesn't it? It, it looks so good. <laughs> when I saw that in the trailer, I had to slow down the speed so I could watch it and like, you know, 0.25 speed so I could really like watch everything. And I was like, man, that that looks great. The other scene where there's the tri-solar Syzygy, the great rift, where the gravity is sucking everyone up off the ground. And I'm like, that looks good too. <laughs> there are many, I think, elements that people are going to look at and think, oh, wow. Well, you know, that's... Yeah. That's, yeah. I'm, really, I'm really excited for people to see 
Judgment Day, the the annihilation of the <laughs> ship, because oh. I think people are going to like, <laughs> I'm, I'm really curious what the general public is going to think after they see that, because as like more and more trailers come through, I think they're going to make it like even more of a spectacle than it is in the books, where in the Chinese adaptation, they almost played it down where it was like, don't worry, everyone on the ship is evil. Like, it's okay if they die. And it's on the Netflix side, it kind of feels like it's going to be like, we are going to make sure that people understand there are innocent lives on this ship. Everyone's going down. <laughs> so it's interesting how the different adaptations are kind of leaning in or away from the spectacle or I guess the morality of things. Yeah, I mean, I think this also exhibits the the, the cultural difference perhaps between the original storyline and I mean, the fact that this is produced in, in the USA, mainly for an American or sort of European audience, uh, people who are used to that kind of thing. It will be interesting actually on the flip side to gauge how viewers in China will see uh, or will appreciate the Netflix adaptation and, and whether or not they would appreciate it for its storytelling. I, you know, it's hard it to be, say. It would be really interesting to know. I mean, from what I understand, Netflix isn't available in China. So I don't know how many people will be able to watch it. I'm sure there are ways, you know, like VPNs. <laughs> I don't, I don't know, but I'm sure there's a way to do it. I do know that some people are, you know, a bit hesitant with the source material being changed to a more like global cast, which I can see, like, I think that's a fair criticism, but I also see the logic it makes where if this did really take place, if this was something that really happened, it would affect everyone on the globe so i mean having different characters reflect that seems like a normal way to do things but i mean i i can say that too because i've watched the chinese adaptation and i loved it and it's very like one to one it's a little bit longer <laughs> i think if you watch the chinese adaptation it's longer than the audiobook is for the first book it's about 30 hours, I want to say, 30 episodes, like long. So <laughs> there, there's definitely some big differences. I, you know, I haven't seen uh, the Chinese adaptation, so maybe you can uh, yeah, send me a link <laughs> later yeah. on so that I can check it out somehow. Yeah, it's, I mean, I loved it. I think, I think the genius in the Chinese adaptation is they did do more with the characters where the relationship between Wang Miao and uh, She are like, they have the, like the most wonderful buddy cop energy. And I found the whole thing delightful, but I don't know, like there's a, there, I have a very soft spot in my heart for the Chinese adaptation, but I'm also <laughs> like ready to watch the, <laughs> the American adaptation and it just being like over the top. You know, like, I'm okay with that. <laughs> but when they have their sort of strategic tactical meeting with uh, the different head, like the CIA and the NATO dudes and so on, um, uh, how is that presented in the Chinese adaptation? Because I, I can't imagine it. <laughs> um, well, the American general is played by an Australian with a very <laughs> Australian uh, accent. <laughs> Mel Gibson syndrome. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think it might have been during COVID, so they couldn't get, you know, foreign uh -huh. actors. Like there was a there wasn't a big availability <laughs> of Americans <laughs> hanging out. But um, so I can't like I can't knock it for that. Fair, fair enough. Fair the, enough. The the actress that played young Hyun Sia was delightful, like so charming mm -hmm. to the point where like, I felt even more sympathy for her than reading the books. But yeah, it, I don't know. It, it was different, but it was fun. Yeah. Okay. I'll have to check it out. I mean, I'm pretty sure that obviously I'll get to see the, the Netflix version first, considering it's coming out in two days. I can't believe it's going to be out. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting for this for so many years. Like the, the moment that it was announced, I was like, I love this. I love this story. I, I'm so excited, but also like cautiously optimistic, you know, like 
I don't want to hype it up too much to the point where I'm disappointed. Got to manage the expectations. Yeah, my my fear with this is also a bit like my fear with uh, Wheel of Time on Prime. It's that, okay, now that you've started it, please finish the story. Don't do another Aragon where you cancel it after the first part. Um, yeah, let's follow it through. And um, yeah, you just never know what the metrics are for Netflix because sometimes they have a really popular show and they cancel it anyway. So um, this would be hard to tell. Yeah, I think it really depends on what the general audience thinks. And I don't know if it, I hope that it hits like hard enough with people that haven't read the books to where they really want to know what's happening in the next season. As far as I can tell, they are going to go up a little bit into book two with season one and they're moving plot lines that take place during the crisis era from book three to season one to make it chronological which i think is very smart in terms of an adaptation because with netflix it's about the numbers it's about how many people watch and i mean that's not <laughs> that's the reality of it and I think moving some of those more dramatic plot lines to the front might help kind of give people that interest if it's a bit more shocking, a bit more interesting, and not so plot driven, <laughs> if that makes sense. I mean, yeah, you, you did a show, uh, was it last week that you did the, the review, review, as it were, where you reviewed the reviews? Um, <laughs> The and, one that was like, it is not Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of you mentioned that people talked about the um, the pace of the series. Um, so obviously, I, well, I'm hoping some of these people have watched the actual series before they decided to put pen to paper. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, does that suggest to you that they're they're going to make it, you know, quicker in some instances and then slow it down? I mean. What just did you get from that? So, I, I mean, I think I know what's going to happen in this first season that is going to lead people to feel like the pacing is a little bit off. Would you like me to talk about it or do you not want to like... <laughs> Some people are weird about spoil what they consider spoilers, so I don't want to like... <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 please. For me, it's okay. not a problem at all. Yeah, yeah. Go for okay. it. Okay. So from what it looks like, the first couple episodes are going to be, you know, the mystery, the deaths of the scientists. And then right around midpoint of the season, we're going to have Judgment Day. So that big, you know, mid-season spectacle. And then towards the end latter half of the season we are going to be dealing with will downing who is like the stand-in for yun tian ming and his relationship or i guess infatuation with just chang who is the cheng ding stand-in so it's going to be like a lot of plot 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 driven and then they're going to explore this more like human connection towards the end. And I think in doing that, it might feel slower for some people because it will be like, why are we spending so much time on this one-sided relationship between these two people? And I think knowing where Jen, Jess Chang's story goes, <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Knowing where it goes and how in the books she she's kind of seen as like Mother Mary, you know, like the Madonna, this caring optimist. And I think it's going to be what we see in season one, what happens to Will Downing that changes her to kind of give her this different outlook on things. And it's going to be really necessary for her character to go through. So, I mean, I can understand why the pacing might feel a little bit off. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I think you are so brave, um, A, because you make these <laughs> cool predictions, but then you are so, uh, you may have noticed, I have not tried to pronounce anybody's name. Up <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm even a bit afraid to pronounce the uh, the Anglo-Saxon names, let alone the, uh, the Chinese ones. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I think it's great that you, um, you, you put it out there, you know, and it's like, there you go. Um, I, I have had people correcting me, so I've got, I've got feedback, so <laughs> not in a mean way, like helpful feedback, not like, you're wrong, don't say it like that. People have been nice. 
<laughs> I I really so when I first got the, the listened to the to the three body problem the second time the uh, the narrator read it in this really cool way and and I I because at the time I had a Chinese student and I I wanted to speak with her about it and get her opinion and and I yeah. and so we we're in our session and I said to her, yeah have you heard of Xi uh, Jinping <laughs> and she said who <laughs> I said you know. Xi Jinping, Liu. and she was like, "What are you talking about?" Um, and then I had to write, I had to type it into the the chat, um, and she and then she aha, and then she said something which for me had nothing to do with the letters whatsoever. But clearly, there is a standard format for how to pronounce these things, which is completely beyond my ability to pronounce. But uh, yeah, three body problem. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure you can sympathize, but like. <laughs> We we both we both live in a country that is not our mother country. So like, yeah. if it would if it would have been in German, I would have been on my feet. It would have been a lot easier. But uh, Chinese, yeah. not my strong suit. No, definitely. But as you mentioned that, I got a, a an update today or an, a notification. And uh, let me just I'm going to pretend that I can pronounce German sentences. But um, so Zeria. Three body problem. Endlich lohnt sich Netflix wieder. Yeah. So this is from the Hamburger Abendblatt, which means it's the evening paper of Hamburg. And basically, what they're trying to say is, with the three body problem, it's now worthwhile watching Netflix. So they yeah. obviously like it. Yeah. The New Yorker had a very positive review of it as well and by a notoriously tough critic who tends to go against the grain on some things where i was like okay like this and and two it was a more intellectual i feel like review it wasn't like this isn't independence day there's not enough you know pew pew alien action going on so i mean i'm really curious i hope that that the series can speak to some people in a way that some of the other shows that are out now aren't. Yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty sure that it, I mean, if people go in to the series with an open mind for what the story may lead to eventually, then I would like to think that they're going to be uh, pleasantly surprised. But I mean, if they're going to go into something thinking, yeah, I can watch it and do the ironing at the same time, then they might be disappointed. Yeah, yeah, it's not it's not going to be one of those shows where you can scroll on your phone during it. No. And I mean, I don't know, like with the reviews, it's very it's very difficult to gauge what what is interesting to someone that isn't to someone else. And I always wonder too, because I mean, like, maybe I have too much faith in, like, journalism as a whole, where I'm like, come on, like, these are people, they've gone to college and university, they're smart, they know what they're talking about. And then sometimes I read some and I'm like, well, I, I don't <laughs> maybe, know. <laughs> maybe not, maybe not. Yeah. I, I agree in a sense that it seems as though sometimes people spend so much time formulating a perspective that they try to reenact that same perspective in every bit of material that they read or watch. Um, and, and I just think that's that's just not possible. So as much as we would like to see objective reviews, we tend to find some very subjective text which simply is written there to enhance the, the journalist's profile rather mm -hmm. than give you a proper assessment of what the potential of the show can be. Yeah, I mean, look, everybody's got to do something which is, I suppose, for their career. You know, if, if they can uh, look really good while mm -hmm. um, yeah, talking absolute crap, then cool. I mean, you mentioned it last time when you talked about Game of Thrones, that there were these reviewers that said it was absolute pants, the storyline is rubbish, <laughs> the characters are <laughs> crap. And then, yeah. I mean, it turned out, into a moderately successful show, I think. <laughs> Moderately, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. I think largely fantasy and science fiction is kind of just, I want to say kind of looked down upon. It's not highbrow enough, right? Where it's not like this very serious drama or I guess sometimes it can feel a bit campy and people don't tend to think that that's, you know, like highbrow <laughs> but 
as a whole, I think this book is very different. And I we both read a lot of science fiction. And I mean, I, I love so much of it. Like I loved The Expanse. It's nowhere near in the same realm of like the type of story as The Expanse, but like two very different series that I still think for me are like really high up there in terms of like what I like to consume as a reader. So I just, I don't know, like, is it just too different for some people who are reviewing it? Maybe. I mean, there's also the people who are really like still to this day, six years later after Game of Thrones, obsessively angry at the showrunners for how it ended. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I looked yeah. a couple days ago and I think there were over a hundred one star reviews on IMDb for a three body problem and the show hasn't come out yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and again, maybe I put too much faith in journalists, but I re really don't believe that these are serious journalists giving it one star reviews. I think even the lowest a journalist would go if it was crap would be like, and I think it's like a three or something. One seems like it's a statement, like it's angry. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I agree with you. I mean, just the trailers are worthy of like a, a, a three uh, because the, the special effects are fantastic. Um, and some of the action and drama you know, exhibited within a, a five or six second, uh, you know, a bit of uh, movie is uh, is fantastic. I mean, the the scene where uh, this this lady jumps into this, I don't know, abyss, a technological yes. abyss, and I'm trying to think to myself, what on earth is that? And um, I mean, that just looks phenomenal. So it was beautiful. It, I mean, like that shot too. I had I had saved screenshots of that where I'm like, ooh, I can't wait to see this segment. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine what the build up to that must be? Um, oh, it's just phenomenal. Yeah, it looks really good. Was there anything that you wanted to touch on? Another another subject real quick before we wrap it up. Where could we where could we go? What I think is pretty interesting is is there a message within the Trisolarians that okay, he uses the three body problem as the vehicle to persuade this civilization that they need to leave their planet mm -hmm. um, and is there a bit of a message there for mankind in a sense that you guys are destroying your environment your planet uh with your own hands you don't need other heavenly bodies to do the job for you um you better start working on your sort of uh you know get out of jail free cards um because also when we think about it in the original uh book when and i've got to try to find the the what's the what's the american guy's name who starts planting Wait. trees everywhere oh mike evans yeah exactly i mean there's the one american in the first section and basically he's an environmentalist who goes to china to plant trees in some obscure village and his dad's actually a billionaire oil whatever um I mean, I think there may be a bit of a political message in that. I don't it's, know if you saw it that way. Yeah, I found it really interesting because on one hand, what Mike Evans is doing is actually noble, right? But the the fallacy there is that these people somehow, some of them, not all of the, not everyone in the ETO, but some of them believe that the Trisolarans, like, hey, we're good people. Like, surely this intelligent life out there, if they're intelligent, they'll have great morals like, like me. It's a bit of a fallacy where it's like, just because someone is intelligent or smart or maybe needs assistance and can communicate with you, it doesn't mean that they're going to show up and be like, let's be friends. Because we all saw what happened when we get to Australia and they're like, oh, don't worry, you won't starve. There's plenty to eat. Look around you. Indeed. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. But but with the ecological side of things, it's really it's really interesting because that seems to be not the ecological side, but I guess like the like the pan species communism where he's like, you know, like if if there's a low number of a species about to be extinct, we should help. Right. That's what you do as a good person. If there's, you know, elephants dying out in the savannah, you know, you you help them and as much as Mike Evans is one of the bad guys, 
it's a noble idea, but is it the right idea? And for me, I think that's what was so interesting because everyone wants to think of themselves as a good person, you know, and like they want to do what is right. And like going into this book, I can so easily see how like I could so easily have ended up on that ship getting sliced into pieces. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Which is going to be another interesting scene, as you say. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think I could also be quite easily taken in by the principle of what, uh, yeah, of what the ETO was uh, presenting to us. But yeah, anyway, so much to look forward to, Amber. So really. much. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, I can't wait. Two days left. So um yeah, I'll, I'll get this up quickly and we'll have to do this again after the series is out and kind of like recap and go over some things. I would love that. And be before we before we end, I want to let people know where they can find your podcast and some of the things you talk about. And I'll link that below. Thank you very much. OK, so as you said uh, at the top, so it's two of the mic. Um, I, I don't talk too much about the uh, the beautiful stories that you go into um, more the shame for me I guess um, I, I tend to focalize on uh, political issues social issues I do a literature review like in a sense of a book uh, more or less once every two months with my brother uh, but I try to talk about any social issues which represent voices that are not commonly heard um, and that's what drives me forward I guess so yeah that's that so if you're interested you can find it in the description and thank you so much for joining me again it's so good to have you back and i really truly cannot wait to reconvene <laughs> after this week <laughs> i was so happy that you asked me again amber and um yeah i as you know i've been a fan of yours for such a long time so i really enjoy it and yep anytime i'll be there it's a date <laughs> All right. We will see you back next time. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe and we will be back later.